Welcome to another episode of the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes, the storytelling show that features The Clearing, where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to be told, and where all my guests have two things in common. They're all creative individuals and all with an interesting story to tell. There are some lovely storytelling metaphors, a clearing, a tree, a juicy storytelling exercise called 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, some alchemy, some gold, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare and a cake. So it's all to play for. So yes, welcome to the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Seamless. And beautiful. Some music for you, Tom Johnson, music composer extraordinaire. Uh, it's not your music, and I'm not quite sure whether you can dance to my music or not. So, how did you feel? I, I feel that you need to talk to me afterwards, and um, and I can provide better music than that for you. <laughs> <laughs> I will take you up on that because, ladies and gentlemen, min 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 min, it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome to the good listening to podcast clearing uh tom johnson known on his website as thomas johnson so he's got yes. a posher version of his name you're sitting there in your musician's emporium i see you have a studio do you not i do yeah uh, and i love it um, and by the way welcome back i googled you before we started and apparently you're an english botanist and royal colonel in the english civil war you died in 1644 uh, welcome back. You were known as the father of British field botany. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea, but I'm very proud of it, actually. But, and really yeah. welcome back. And so, yeah. yes, so that, that was the first thing that came up. But the good news is I, I also went a bit deeper and I know that you are Thomas Johnson. And can, can I just blow a bit of happy smoke at you? Please do. So Tom, in his own words, I live in the Cotswolds in the United Kingdom. I've composed hundreds of scores for all sorts of different kinds of theatre music, from tiny studios, mid-scale theatres, parks, schools, on Broadway, on the beach from Minnesota to Moscow, ranging from solo harp to full orchestra. And that indeed is just a, a, a sort of frisson of your extraordinary and sublime talent. So you're extremely welcome, Tom Johnson. Well, remarkably, I think all of that is actually true, which is, I mean, the you know, what I said about living in the Cotswolds and all the, the all those things I've done, you know, yes, not, a, not a lie there. Absolutely. And we, we have history in that you way back when were also one of the wonderful musician ensemble within Instant Wit, the comedy yeah. show that I co-run with Stephanie Weston to this day. Yeah. And... Um, you will be able to speak, I promise. And I'm delighted to see you, by the way. Really happy to see you. Yeah. We, we reconnected at a mutual friend's 60th birthday, Craig Edwards, who's also been uh, a guest here in the podcast, too. Um, you also mentioned Vic Llewellyn. We've got lots of people. Vic Llewellyn, who I, um, as you pointed out, uh, immediately went live, but then needed to go for a wee. So the good news was I've done a wee today and all is good. And so have I. Yes. And at our age. And yes. You, and, and what I was going on to say is that you were very brilliantly uh, the composer for a short film that I made circa 2006 called Knock Knock. So Good God, was it 2006? It was, which is aging as both. And as you said, you yeah. know, at our age, what did you talk about? When we need to do a we at our age. But you said. Oh, uh, well, in, in Ruskin, we have a saying that an hour is a long time for an old bladder. Wonderful. Yeah. And yeah. talking of old blathers, here you are. <laughs> <laughs> so two old people who are going to blather and bladder on. And yeah. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Good Listening To show. Uh, it's going to be a curated journey through the usual familiar storytelling metaphors. There's going to be a clearing a tree, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare, a random bit of cake as well. It's, it's, it's all to play for. Yes. So first of all, how's morale? What's, what's your story of the day, please, Tom Johnson? My story of the day? Well, it's... I woke up and, of course, it's an absolutely stunning day here in Stroud. Uh, the sun is shining. The frost is on the ground. Um, my nephew is over from Ireland. So we went for a little stroll down through the village and into the fields. And that was delightful. Um, and a little bit, you know, um, I had the good fortune. There's a pop up pub that happens every so often across the road, which is it's like 100 feet away from my house. So every so often there's this pub. Uh, in the school chapel, old school chapel. 
and uh, chapel uh, school room. That's what it's called. I have to say, it's my kind of school with a pub in the chapel. Well, right? exactly. It is, and and um, anyway, they over uh, they overestimated how much beer they needed this weekend. So on Sunday morning, they said to me, "We've still got like half a barrel of beer. Do you want it?" So um, and I thought, well, why the hell not? So I so anyway, long story short, last night quite a lot of free beer imbibed. Um, and it was delightful. So a little bit sketchy this morning, but you know the sunshine has cleared that up. And here I am now. Yeah. And, oh, and I great. played an accordion as well. So, and, and what did you say about the accordion? I played a bit of accordion just before we talked. Yes, uh, to practice for a little two-hander show that I'm doing with a friend of mine, Chris Garner, um, who you might know. I don't know. He works with the Natural Theatre Company, but anyway, we're doing. A Christmas carol, a, a sort of reading for posh restaurants, a few dates this Christmas. And I'm playing a bit of accordion, you know, a bit of Christmas money to pay for the turkey. Yeah. Very Dickensian of you. And, and <laughs> so, you, you are brilliant at the accordion. That was the main instrument uh, that you use for the knock knock uh, music as well. And right. you're a great company. I think regionally there's the lovely Pete Rosser as well, who's another accordionist. Although he's back, he's up in the north country now. Uh, ha ha ha. And yes, you are a multi-instrumentalist. I mean, just looking yes. at you, you can see that. So just run us through the sort of the different instruments one can play, please. Well, my main instrument is the violin. Um, and then and the guitar, various different guitars, electric and acoustic. Um, I picked up the accordion. I learned the accordion really for specifically for theatre because it's such an incredible. It's a brilliant instrument for theatre because it's portable. Um, and it's much more adaptable and multi-genre than people give it credence for. You know, people yes. think of it as the French instrument, but you can do an incredible number of different kind of things. And it's a very atmospheric instrument. So I I sort of learned that for theatre specifically. Um, so I suppose that's it, really. Violin, guitar, recording. Yeah. And I was happily dissing you this morning by Tom, always on the fiddle, Johnson was what I put. Yes, I've never heard that joke before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so I'd just like to apologise for doing it again, obviously. <laughs> Hurrah. So uh, you're extremely welcome. Anything else you'd like to say before I get you on the open road? Anything you should like to say? No, anything you'd like to say before oh, I, I see. get you on the open um, road? Well, just, just delightful to be here. And, um, you know, I'm also sort of terrified about the idea of talking about myself for an hour because... Uh, I, I can, I'm quite good at boring myself to death. So. Don't you worry, I'll shut you up before an hour. Don't you worry. OK, so let's get you on the open road. So it's going to be a clearing a tree, juicy story telling exercise called 54321, some yes. alchemy, some gold, cheeky bit of Shakespeare, a couple of random squirrels and a cake. Hurrah! The cake is, uh, I don't understand the cake bit, but I suppose I'll find out in due course. Yes, that's the final storytelling metaphor where you get to put a cherry on the cake, but I will explain that. OK, good. if anyone's yeah. struggling with what the heck is this about? I think Desert Island Discs, but in a clearing and with stories rather than music. All good. It's kind of how I explained it to my nephew yesterday, yesterday last night, actually. So there ah, you go. Through the through beer goggles, because you were imbibing. A bit well, of yeah, beer. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. And, that helps. So, and by the way, uh, thank you for saying yes. It was a delight to reconnect with you a couple of weeks ago, as I yeah. did. So I'm, I'm yeah. really, really sincerely happy to see you. Uh, if I was sitting next to you, I might even try and lick your face. Thank you. <laughs> so, to Thomas Johnson, extraordinary composer. You are deeply gifted, by the way, and we're going to be able to talk about exactly where we can find out more about you and your music and your sort of yeah. archive on SoundCloud, that sort of thing, and current projects towards the end. Yeah. So welcome to The Clearing, where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to get told. So first of all, Let's base it in your clearing. Where is, what is a clearing like for Tom Johnson, composer? Where do you go to get clutter-free, inspirational and able to think? Well, it probably is here, actually, in my studio. Um, so this is the egg house. It's called an egg house. It's called the egg house because from above it's egg shaped. It's very hard to explain, but it is, believe me. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I, this is a really good focused place where I can find my flow. It's incredibly uh, calm and amazing, beautiful view out the front here um, across the Cotswolds to Selsley Common. And um, it's all just very nice and contained. And I've got all my stuff and um, it's calm. It's a calm place to be and to work. Um, yeah. 
And there is a backstory as well, because I, I remember very powerfully, you did have a house fire and a Christmas tree incident. There so they, was indeed, yes. So do you want to just tell us a bit more about that? Because you, uh, you, you said something that really struck me when I, you said most of the time insurers tell us that people move away from the house in which nearly yeah. burned down, but you've absolutely remade it as you're, you know, you've, you've reconnected to it. Yeah. So do you want me to tell you about the, the fire? Unless you're going to talk about that later. But no, I'm... no, I'm not. Going, I wasn't planning on talking about it. But um, yeah, so 12th night, s- some 12 years ago, um, uh, we used to have used to have uh, candles on our Christmas tree. Used to. Um, and uh, 12th night, we we're going to get rid of the decorations in the tree, but we we're going to have one last um, burn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we did have a last burn um so my dear darling rachel um lit a candle um and but in front of her eyes uh the tree caught fire in front of her very eyes and um i can't tell you how quickly it went up it i was sort of standing looking and ah there's a fire called the fire brigade like immediately and within a minute the flames were arcing across the room and um there was no putting it out there's no question of being able to put water on it right? um my 11 year old son was in the well just about to get in the bath uh so we had to call him downstairs very quickly and honestly the whole thing went up in flames very very quickly and we were outside um in the freezing cold and it was a very very cold winter it's the coldest we've had for a long time so it was sort of minus four or something outside and there we were outside the house uh wearing very little uh because it was all nice and cozy inside uh watching our house burn down uh it was very weird very weird um and the fire brigade couldn't make it very quickly because the roads were all closed because there was so much snow so they couldn't get here eventually they got here in little four by fours um they couldn't then get the fire hydrant because it was under snow so it was sort of mad and surreal um and so that happened and then we were out we couldn't live in a house for six months or something like that uk health radio the station that makes you feel good The station that makes you feel good. Uh, but no, you're right. The insurer said most people move out after they've burnt their house down. But um, we didn't see any reason to. You know, it, we love it. And it was all redone nicely because we were insured, thank God. And the advantage was that so uh, everything was new after that so you know <laughs> out of <laughs> adversity <laughs> comes great re- reinvigoration yes well exactly so you know all you know all the white goods were just brand new and all the walls and windows and everything were sort of spick and span and brand new so so was, there was that advantage to it but i would still not recommend dear viewer um doing this to your house just to get a few um uh, new white goods it's probably yes. not worth it but it didn't, no. stri- it didn't strike me at the time nor, nor do you strike me as somebody who's all about the insurance job <laughs> no no it was really grim yes. <laughs> it was really grim at the time and, and i'm very- able to look back on it um with this sort of gallows smile now but it was yes. grim at the time yeah. Very, very Dickensian again, coming full circle to that. You're about to do another Christmas carol, but it was on the 12th night and all that stuff. Well, exactly. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, we're sort of very careful about uh, not setting fire to the house on 12th night these days. Yes. We've succeeded so far. So that's good. And there is that expression, lightning never strikes twice. So uh, hopefully. Well, actually, not... the insurer said, um, amazingly, our insurance premium went down after that. And I said why how come and they said well because it's just never happened you you know touch wood uh people don't generally have two house fires so it doesn't sort of do anything to your premium which is weird wow it sounds like we've even got a kind insurance company there as well i i have to say they they were pretty bloody good yeah 
Yes. Wow. I've, I've never thought of sort of trying to sort of amplify or crank the handle of an insurance company. Well, no, right. just before. <laughs> no. no. Well, thank you for telling us that. But what's so lovely is you're still there within the egg studio, as, as I think you called it. Yes. So the egg, the egg house, egg house. Uh, is separate from the house house. Yeah. So the egg house was untouched. Yeah. And actually, all my musical instruments were in here, in, in here. So it could have been a lot worse. So yes. I didn't lose any of my, like my fiddle was in here and stuff. So I, um, there were a lot of really precious musical things that weren't touched. So that that was good, and it's lovely to have your clearing as being right where you're sat now within your yeah. own muse house, if you like, called the egg, yeah. the egg house. Egg house. house, lovely. And so now I'm going to arrive with a tree, if I may, but not a Christmas tree. Easy, Tiger. Uh, nor are there candles on it. I'm going to arrive with a tree now. We're waiting for God to ask. I'm going to shake your tree now to see which storytelling apples fall out. How would you like these apples? So this is your second bit of preparation, apart from waiting for clearing, which is uh, your responses to the 4321. Five minutes to have thought about the four yeah. things that have shaped you, Tom, the three things that inspire you, the two things that never fail to grab your attention. That's where the two squirrels come in. Bolt squirrels. You know what yeah. never fails to grab your attention. And then the quirky or unusual fact about you. So over to you. How would you like to shake the canape of your trees, please? Well, let's do the four the four shaping things first. Um, so I suppose. So, yeah. So these are things that kind of. So, yeah, they're the things that have shaped your my life, isn't it? That's what you're sort of after. Um, so the first one is uh when i was 11 years old i uh, was a minstrel medieval minstrel in chillum castle in kent so this was a sort of rowdy affair um where every friday and saturday night people came and they had a medieval banquet in this medieval in this castle and they had mead and all sorts of stuff um and wenches, you probably wouldn't do that anymore, would you? But uh, there were wenches serving things, and then there were minstrels, and um, there was a sort of grown-up minstrel band. But age 11, the manager discovered I played the fiddle, and he thought it would be really cute to have me play. So I did a 20-minute set um, in my tights and things <laughs> on Friday and Saturday night every weekend. And it was, uh, I think, you know, looking back on it, it, is one of the reasons why I ended up doing what I do now um, uh, because it was pretty rowdy. The audience was pretty rowdy. They, the mead was free and free flowing. And so at an early age, I was having to play the violin in front of raucous audiences. So I sort of, I learned how to do it. I learned how to control potentially quite tricky audiences from a really young age and i enjoyed it really loved it i really loved the showing off bit of it you know and of course they loved me because i was a young lad playing the violin um so that's uh and i suppose uh also it kind of introduced me to the idea of a good night out the uh you know that um can't remember who was it who wrote that book can't remember his name now. Anyway, the whole idea of theatre should be a good night out. And I suppose I was sort of introduced to the idea of a good night out and the importance of that when I was 11. So that's one of one of the shaping things. Um, then uh, brother, your your ability to, as you say, control a potentially raucous audience using music. Yeah. I've definitely experienced yeah. that. Right. Tiana Nogue was one of the many, many shows that I've seen that you've done uh -huh. for. Yeah, uh, it was just a really good example of that. Not that the audience, but the story's you know, wonderfully <laughs> anarchic and a, yeah. all about, you know, it, that was just one example of how, gosh, the music adds that extra fifth dimension to the show. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, when I was 11 doing that thing, I was it wasn't it was just it was a gig rather than doing theatre. But, you know, yeah. I think I brought a lot of that energy into my theatre writing. And actually, that sort of does bring me on to that. The second uh, shaper, which was punk rock uh so i remember you know age 16 because i was i was 15 in 1976 when it all started happening so i was absolutely the right age for punk and i remember a friend giving me an album by a band called the clash and uh i put it on and it was like nothing i'd ever heard and i think it's really hard now for us to remember that to remember how incredibly radical that stuff was 
how completely fresh and totally unusual and unique that sound was at the time because we're just really used to it now um anyway so yeah i heard the clash and i was sort of that was a, that was an epiphany that was a sort of moment of wow this is uh amazing because i what i suppose what it was was the directness of it and uh you know no longer are we singing in american accents with 85 minute drum sound solos we're <laughs> singing in our voices about things that matter and nice and tight and compact and concise and with incredible energy an old diy thing of it you know anyone can do it and I think that was really uh, formative for me. I think that, and that did that really did shape how I approached theatre music, composing theatre music as well. Sort of realizing that the in you know energy and uh, energy and emotional truth can sometimes be more important than technical virtuosity. I mean, I, I don't want to. Technical virtuosity is really important. I'm not sort of saying it isn't, but but. I think that I've never stopped having some sort of rawness in my approach, whether it be my composing approach or my playing approach. And I think uh, that comes from the old punk thing. So, yeah, that was big shaping thing for me. And beautifully connected those two things and going back to you being a sort of medieval minstrel. So there's there's there's, yeah. a, there's historical legacy into how to entertain going on there. I think so. I think my 11 to 15 year old experience of gigging these regular um pretty pretty uh raucous gigs already i had a sort of sense of anarchy before um anarchy in the uk happened and so i was <laughs> primed and ready to go nicely put <laughs> lovely segue <laughs> and we've, we've got the gift of the, the image of you in tights as well which is i know well amazing. marvelous yes. <laughs> and a little little triangular felt cap with a feather in it yes and uh, and a little jerkin which i have to say my dad made for me which i think is rather nice it wasn't my mum my my dad made this kind of kit for me which is quite sweet really yes lovely <laughs> lovely um well third, third shapeage third, third shakeage um it was just a bit of syn- uh, an extraordinary bit of synchronicity uh or i what i don't know what you'd call it really but so 24 years oldish in living in Sheffield, having recently graduated, wondering what on earth to do with my life. And um, I was sort of interested in, you know, just hold that line, Colin. Did you study music at Sheffield? Uh, No, I neither studied music nor in Sheffield. So I I studied, (laughs) I studied English literature at Oxford. Uh, sorry, I, I thought you said you wind forward to you being the age in the twenties, and I, I heard Sheffield, so I made that up. Yeah, no, 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 you didn't. No, I was living in Sheffield. It's just oh, sorry. That by, that, by that point, I moved away from Oxford, where I so I lived. I lived for three years in Oxford, where I studied English, um, and then um, my girlfriend at the time did German, and she did it in Sheffield. So I moved with her, and then a week after arriving, she dumped me. But there you go. Um, and there I was in Sheffield thinking, oh, right. That's so my girlfriend's dumped me. What on earth am I doing here anyway? Um, so I was a musician, obviously, and sort of vaguely interested in maybe theatre. And a friend of mine said, oh, there's this newspaper called The Stage Newspaper. You should buy it because there are adverts in it for jobs. So I bought it. I never heard it, heard of it. And the, there was an advert for a job in that first, very first stage newspaper I bought. And the advert was um, a company in Stroud, which I'd never heard of, called Dr. Foster's Theatre Company. And they were looking for a musician. And I applied um, and, and got an interview and got the job. And just that friend of mine saying, buy this, this, this stage newspaper, was completely transformed my life because I live in Stroud now. And Dr. Foster's, I got the job and then I worked with them for five years and made a really important, uh, really central connection to this guy, Greg Banks, yes. who uh, co-ran the company. And he's become a lifelong friend and also a lifelong colleague. Um, and so we've made a lot of theatre together, um, uh, including going out to America and working there together. And um, and I sort of learned my theatre chops with Greg, really. So that one 
kind of by the stage newspaper comment shaped my wife, wife, no, not my wife, <laughs> life, <laughs> shaped my life in, a, you know, an extraordinary way. And I, I, often, I love that expression, theatre chops. I learnt my theatre chops. Theatre chops, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I want, you know, if I hadn't seen that mate on that day, uh, this whole thing wouldn't have happened. Something else would have happened. There it's is that just, lovely thing, isn't there? What's meant for you won't pass you by, provided you're receptive to what the heck's going on in front of you. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it makes you wonder what other paths weren't taken. Yes. Because they just didn't. Come and up. every now and again, opportunities are like doors on or windows on totally lubricated hinges. Yeah. Blow open yeah. for you. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And Greg Banks, I reconnected with him just the same night I reconnected with same you night, about yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. Well, he lives over there. I mean, you know, sort of two miles that way. Uh, he's, you know, a really good friend. And um, yeah, we've done lots of work together. So, um, yeah. So that shapage, the stage newspaper, that fateful day. That fateful day, I know. Fourth shapage, and sorry if I interrupted you. Fourth, you might I know, fourth shapage. Uh, I mean, I don't think it sort of is particularly a career thing or anything, but the birth of my children, it's impossible to not think of that as, you know, the most massive radical shapage of anything that could have happened, really. So, uh, but that's just a sort of huge, huge yes. life thing. The Gabriel and the Zackage that arrived. Gabriel and the Zackage, exactly. Yeah. Lovely. Anything yeah. else you want to say about how they've shaped you? You don't have to, because that, that says it. I, it's so kind of myriad and huge. It's impossible to sort of, I, it, you know, I, everything really. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, no, I love that. Just let, let it hang there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gabriel and the Zackage. Yeah. Beautiful. And now, uh, three things that inspire you. And if there's any overlap, don't worry, because this is all very inspirational in any way, what you're talking about. OK, I mean, sticking with family. Uh, my mum, my mum, she's uh, incredibly inspiring. Uh, she's 96. She's lived through, you know, so much in her life, not just the kind of history of her life, like, you know, the second world war and you know all those things but also she's you know she's dealt with an uh, extraordinary number of bereavements and and very hard things to deal with in her life and she just uh the reason she's inspirational is she just keeps going she just she's got this endless positivity just um that she's 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 unbowed by everything that comes her way even now you know she she's got dementia now and mouth cancer and lives in a care home and every time I see her there's a sort of she's still able to produce this incredible humor to it all and um and everybody in the care home they all love her to bits and you know they say that she's incredibly funny and stuff and um yeah uh, wow I'd like to be able to have some of that as I get older. <laughs> I suppose what? it's resilience, you know. Yes. Resilience. And, and, and the, the lovely Johnson matriarch, what's her name? Joan. Wonderful. Joan, Joan Johnson. Lovely yeah. bit of alliteration in there as well. Yes. Well, she was, well, her elder sister was going to be Mavis Joan Johnson, but it turned out that Mavis was born and then the midwife said, oh, uh, Mrs. Johnson, uh, Mrs. Hill, sorry, um, uh, you've you've got a you, there's another one. Um, so they, her mum didn't know that she had twins until literally she was giving birth. Wow! Uh, so Mavis Joan Hill became two children: Mavis Hill and Joan Hill. So, lovely. <laughs> yes, lovely. Yeah, and I'm happy that she's still with us, and and yeah, gosh, how profound! And she's yeah. still, still got a, an optimistic way of inspiring that's wonderful exactly yeah um then i suppose uh um uh, a big inspiration for me is just people singing together and that can be that that's really wide i think i just really i'm really moved by uh, by people singing together in all sorts of different formats so if people are all singing together 
just in a sort of sing along in a pub or something. I find it very moving. It's so it's so connecting. Um, but then there's you know, in a more kind of um, pure musical sense, close harmony singing song by an incredibly talented choir is just incredibly spine tingly and incredibly beautiful and. Uh, and then community choirs. I, I do a lot of work with community choirs and ha- have done a lot of work over the years. And it's just, yeah, people singing together. It's just, a, it's such a direct sense of community that singing brings. And um, it can, it allows people to be very emotional and drop their guard in a sort of safe space, you know. As a galvanizing um, of energy. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Of course, mu- musical direction is the is the extra dimension to, to beyond being a composer as well. The fact you are a choir yeah. master as well. So you're yeah. Composing in all aspects because you're doing instruments and voices, which, of course, are instruments of themselves. Exactly. And a lot of my work uh, is for voices. I, I think, you know, in some ways, actually, I think I uh, it's possibly writing for the human voices is, is possibly the thing I like to do most of all. Um, it's. It, it's just so immediate and direct and emotional and um and beautiful and human um and i just love working with choirs as well i love the energy of 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 it and i particularly with community choirs i i just love getting a bunch of people together and and um and going for excellence you know knowing that you can you can make it sound brilliant it, you, you don't have to go for second best you can make it sound fantastic and and i find that you know um members of a community choir are really up for working hard and and excelling and um and that's exciting it's really thrilling to get yeah to make a sound a, a collective sound that nobody thought was really possible to do i think it's brilliant Beautifully put. And do you have a central hub choir or are you peripatetic where you go wherever the choirs require you? Wherever the choirs require you. Um, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't have, um, I don't have my own choir. Um, uh, and it's so uh, I'm some quite often I'm not working with any choirs at all, but um, uh, there was a job I did a few years ago, which I really loved, which was, um, at tobacco, tobacco factory in Bristol, uh, they did a play called Beautiful Thing and uh, Mike Tweddle, the artistic director who directed the show, he it was his idea to have a community, to create a tobacco factory community choir, especially for the show. And then my job was to select and arrange a collection of 90s pop songs to turn into choral pieces because the play was set in the 90s. It was really, really, really good fun. And um, we had a ball and we we made our own choir and I and I arranged these 90s pop songs and it was good fun. And I'm really glad to say that the choir still exists. Um, oh, wonderful. Because I was really I really wanted there to be legacy from the project. I didn't want the choir to just stop, you know, um, after the show. And uh, Ailey Debonair, who's um, a brilliant woman, she... Um, and she works at the tobacco battery. She has nurtured the choir and made sure it carries on. So that's brilliant. But now, um, from a choral point of view, I'm involved in a company called Frozen Light. They're an amazing company. They do um, multi-sensory theatre for audiences of people with living with profound and multiple learning disabilities that's their audiences so their theater is multi-sensory so it's all about um smells and textures and um, lights and sounds and all that sort of thing and they wanted to make a choral piece so the main sensory experience would be lots of voices so um they asked me to write a choral piece for for that show and it's so it's a four, 45 minutes of of choral song that i composed um and uh the whole show is in uh, we're in a great big circle so the audience and the choir are in a great big circle and we sing and various other things happen um multi-sensory things happen and we've be, we've played it at two two different festivals so far 
Um, and the idea is it's in their repertory as a company now, and they they want it to carry on for a few for the next few years, going to different festivals. And the idea wherever we go, we um, recruit a community choir from the community. So part of the idea is we're bringing a community of singers and meeting a community of people who live with these disabilities. So we're kind of creating connections um, within a community between these different groups of people. And so far it's been incredibly successful and a really, really moving thing to be part of. Um, So yes, I'm doing that in, we're doing that at Lowry in January and then we're carrying on doing it for as long as it'll last really. And is Lowry from Sheffield? I'm just thinking about going full circle. Is that bringing you back to Sheffield? That's Salford, the Lowry. Is the right answer. Just testing, no. see what you did there. It's on the, <laughs> from a Sheffielder's point of view, it's the wrong side of the Pennines. Apologies yeah. to anyone from Sheffield. I, yeah. I love the fact that, that, what's that show again? It's called Frozen? Uh, the company's called Frozen Light, and Frozen Light. the show is called Fire Songs. Yeah. Beautiful. So Beautiful. if there's any um, festival producers out there wanting to book something extraordinary, then book that yes yeah i I sincerely well i'd love to come and see it and i hope they do and i hope they're listening and and do just that yes uk health radio the station that makes you feel good uk health radio the station that makes you feel good So I think we could be on to the third inspirational. Ah, crikey, we are, blimey. Um, this is a yeah, this is a sort of trickier one in that there are various people who, you know, individuals who I find very inspiring within the arts community. Um, and, and I suppose... Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether to name them or not, really, but it's to do with um, there are certain individuals I've met who just have an, uh, a, a sort of a fearless vision that then they act on. You know, I, I don't know. It feels quite un, quite rare in a way. Uh, there are some people I've met who just they absolutely know what it is they want to do, and rather than do what. I tend to do, and this is a great idea, and then nothing happens. <laughs> they go and do it, you know, and endlessly they do it. You know, they'll invent a project and then they'll do it and then they'll invent something else and they'll just carry on doing it. And it's just, I, that's properly inspirational. Uh, and by all means, that. mention, you just flam out a few names if you want to. But that's okay. so uh, lovely. Well, that's so generous. Viv Gordon, um, uh, who's a Somerset artist. Um, she she set up her company, the Viv Gordon Company, who I've done quite a bit of work with, and we're doing something in January uh, together called Restless, which is uh, so her work is to do with um, uh, being a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and so she wants to break the the silence around that subject. So um, and so her work is about that, and so in January we're going to work together on one of her projects where we, she's decided she wants to do a. Uh, this is going around full circle. Uh, she wants to do a, a punk um, sort of theatre gig style thing about childhood sexual abuse. But she's really drawn to the idea of doing punk, you know, and really sort of shouting about it because that feels like it's really breaking a lot of taboos. So, so that's a project we're in the process of making. So and I, I, I see the through line there: the clash of domestic abuse and you know all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, abuse. yes, yeah, yeah. Wow. And she's amazing. She's just doggedly determined to get her um, message across. You know, I just, I really admire the energy of that. And then there's um, two Helens. There's Helen Porter and Helen Chadwick, both of whom are singers. Um, And again, you know, they, they both just have a thing they want to do and then they just do it. And it's just, you know, I just, I mean, I'm impressed by that. Um, I mean, you know, there are, in a way, the reason I wasn't sure about naming people is because there are, you know, lots of people who do this, really. But I don't know. Yeah, it's just impressive, really. That's a lovely rule of three. You've given us three examples. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
The best yeah. communication happens in threes. How lovely. Exactly. And now we could be on to two things that never fail to grab your attention. This is where the squirrels from the film up. Oh, no, squirrels come in. So what never fails to grab your attention, Mr. Johnson? I find it hard to walk past a really good guitar shop. <laughs> <laughs> That's a happy surprise. I thought you were going to say pub there in real ale. But no, guitar shop. Yes. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite hard Yeah, to... I think that might be a bit of a squirrel moment. Um, and uh, not necessarily just guitar shop, but, you know, a sort of musical instrument shop, as long as it's really good. And I can happily <clears throat> spend all day playing all their incredibly expensive guitars and then not buying any of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, of course, I would buy all of them probably if I could. But um, so that's, yeah, that's that, that, that's, that's an attention grabber. And uh, funnily enough, you did, uh, you, you did spot the other one. I'm that transparent. Um, a really, really good pub in, in the mountains, if possible, um, with a sunset view. Oh, uh, that's pretty, you know, it's pretty hard to avoid if I happen to chance upon it. So, um, yeah. I, I wish you well. I hope you happen upon it more often than you know. Wonderful. Yes. It's great. Thank you. OK, and now uh, a quirky or unusual fact about you we couldn't possibly know until you tell us. Um, very hard question, that one. Um, I don't know what's quirky or unusual about me, but I suppose it's slightly unusual that I've never done anything other than what I do for, you know, work wise. So I've I've never had I really have never had a job. Other than this one. And, so, and bless if your dogged determination, because, you know, what you're what, you, what you've been describing is an incredible journey of craftsmanship and is, is a, a great beauty. But at some cost, because we know the artist's way is not an easy one. You know, we've no. had many conversations about, you know, the struggle of creativity. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, um, you know, especially since Covid, as we all know, we've all seen a lot of people in our industry quitting it. And, you know, um, it, it was already pretty hard. And then COVID just was the last straw, wasn't it, for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a damn hard thing to stay at. And I do, sometimes I envy um, uh, people who've got other things on, you know, side hustles that they can do that are quite remunerative, you know, yes. um, trades that they've got i don't know you know carpentry skills or whatever it is and you know i suppose that's um uh there's a question later on about what advice would you give to yourself as a younger person i suppose that's you know possibly a bit of that's a, an advice i might give to myself as a younger person is get um get a remunerative trade under your belt that you can do in between times you know and do you have any clues on what that might be now you've got your gift to self from older self well, the trouble is that I'm, you know, I'm, I struggle with putting a shelf up. So, you know, <laughs> I'm a DIY uh, fuckwit. Fuck There's no other yeah, way. Exactly. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so I have this horrible feeling that I do what I do because it is actually the only thing I can do. Because it's, it's what you do, Tom Johnson. It's what I do because it is actually the only thing I can do. Because it's what you do, Tom Johnson. It's because I want, it's what I do. Yeah. That's a good epitaph. It's what I do. It's what it's I what do. I, I what I <laughs> See what you're doing there, playing with the tenses. Um, yes. So now uh, we'll talk about alchemy and gold. We stay in the clearing. We've done a wonderful bit of tree foliage shakage. Now we stay in the clearing and we're going to talk about alchemy and gold now. You've been okay. giving us by the bucket load anyway, but when you're at purpose and in flow, what are you most happy doing and revealing to the world, Tom Johnson? Well, probably uh, running running a rehearsal, running a room in a rehearsal um, when it's going really well. Obviously, there are many, many times when it isn't or when it's just kind of what you're doing. But there are these magical occasional moments when I'm running a room doing whatever it is, you know, either a group of singers or a group of actors or musicians, whatever it is. And we're all just really there and really just making it happen and there's nothing better actually than than that and the full circle of when your 11 year old self dressed in your your sort of minstrel garb fiddling a room that's yes. like 
facilitating, enabling, fiddling with yeah. a room to make the magic of a rehearsal happen. Yes, full circle. Yes. No, that's right. And, uh, you know, it's funny because I suppose um, my one of the reasons I love my job is the composing bit is really solitary. So, you know, my clearing is the egg house here where I am by myself and it's really quiet and I'm working. I have the flow to just be here doing my stuff here. But then I then you have the opportunity to go out and MD and work in a room with people. And that's that's brilliant. You know, having both. I I wouldn't want to do just the sitting composing bit by itself. You know. um, the collaborative bit is really important and really lovely, really rewarding. There's a lovely sort of centrifugal force in that. It starts from an inner hub and then emanates out. Yeah. 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 And. uh as it emanates out, you're having to negotiate lots of other people's opinions and feelings. And, yeah. and that's great. I love it. You know, it's, fantastic. it's obviously sometimes it's bloody irritating because other people yes. have opinions, but, yes, but yes. Um, yeah, other people. No, but you know, it's a fantastic thing. about there's, there's, that, there's that Sartre quote, John, Paul, you know, hell is other people, but I yeah. also bliss is other people too. Well, yeah, a bit of both. A bit of both. Yeah. Um, so now then, this is the cake moment, and you've given us the advice to younger self already. So the cake is a, a cherry on the cake of a multi-layered cake of yes. stuff like what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, and then we're ramping up to legacy uh, inspired by Shakespeare and all the world's a stage and all the biddly players. When we'll be talking about yes. how, when all is said and done, you would most like to be remembered. Yes. Okay. So that's your cake. Uh, how would you like to interpret it? Oh, and a favourite quote that's given you sucker. OK, well, uh, so my favourite quote is T.S. Eliot, which is, uh, for us, there is only the trying. The rest is not our business. And I like that because, um, it, well, it helps you to not get too bothered about outcome. You know, all you can do is do your best, just, you know, Give it your best shot. And also that's, uh, it's a thing my mum used to say a lot when I was younger. So there's this, you know, comes from her. But also uh, I'm going to cheat because I've got a few, uh, there's three quotes I like. Another is from my mum, which is actually just her. She says, adapt or die, she says, which I think is quite good. Um, and then there's um, Beckett, a bit dark, but um, you must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. I think that's rather lovely. Um, then, OK, best advice I've had um, is something from Greg Banks, although I think he got it from his tutor at Dartington, Joe Richards, and it's trust the process. Uh, and I think that's um, it's really good in work, isn't it? It's really good when you're um, meeting a new group of people to work with, especially a new director. You, I think you just have to trust the process and trust that it's going to lead somewhere and be a good thing. Um, but also I think that's a good thing for life as well. Um, yeah. Is there, have I missed anything? No, I'm just really blown away by how, um, what a beautiful interpretation of that part that was. Yeah. And now, and I'm wanting to just hang it there with silence because that was lovely. Um bit of Shakespeare now, how when all is said and done, let's talk about legacy now, Tom, when all is said and done, how would you like to be remembered? As that guy who became incredibly wealthy and successful age 65. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So you are awesome. You are Tom Johnson. As this has been your moment in the Good Listening to Clearing Sunshine, yeah. is there anything else, Tom, you'd like to say before we do the very important bit of where we can find out more about you, but is there anything else you'd like to say? Just that it's been a pleasure doing this and um, lovely to meet you on the screen over there. And yeah, great. It's been more enjoyable than I thought it would be and uh, less nerve wracking. So thank you. You're very welcome. And where can we find out more about uh, the wonderful Tom Johnson composer or Thomas Johnson, as he's known on the website, uh, on the hold hint web, please. Uh, well, uh, my website is thomasjohnsoncomposer.com. But you can also hear a shed load of my music on 
soundcloud uh, what is it soundcloud.com forward slash thomas f johnson and you can hear lots of music there and if you do want to get hold of me you can get hold of me via the website so, and what does the f in the f johnson stand for frederick which is my grandfather wonderful yeah so, um, ladies and gentlemen, Min Min Min, you've been listening to the Good Listening To show with the glorious uh, composer and wonderful human being that is Mr. Tom Johnson. Thank you very much indeed. And Thank you. Uh, yes, and I think unless there's anything else you'd like to say, good night. I think is coming up. Good night, and see you for a pint somewhere. Uh, let's make an absolute point of it. You've been yes. a joy, and you continue to be a joy. And I hope you're minted by the time you're sixty-five too. So you are. <laughs> <laughs> Just send cash to Tom Johnson and send some to me too. And good night. You've been listening to the Good Listening To show here on UK Health Radio with me, Chris Grimes. Oh, it's my son. If you've enjoyed the show, then please do tune in next week to listen to more stories from The Clearing. If you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, then please do so. There's also a dedicated Facebook group for the show too. You can contact me about the programme, or if you'd be interested in experiencing some personal impact coaching with me, care of my Level Up Your Impact programme, that's chris at secondcurve.uk. On Twitter and Instagram, it's... At that Chris Grimes. So until next time, from me, Chris Grimes, from UK Health Radio, and from Stan... To your good health. And goodbye. So, Tom, you've just been given a damn good listening to. Can I just get your immediate feedback on what that was like for you? What's the curated journey of this been like as an experience? Very curated, which is good. So very held, very contained. Um, it was really, really good to be able to do a little bit of prep beforehand and and um, know what was coming up. Because I suspect had you asked me these things uh, without any um without any uh, thought I'd have forward planning I would have probably frozen most of the time so um that was really good no it's been it's it's been good it's really great actually yeah. wonderful and if you had an instinct in terms of playing it forward who who would you most recommend I talk to next oh blimey um uh, well uh Helen Chadwick who was one of my uh people that I mentioned um would be very interesting yeah. Thank you. I just thought I'd get, I don't always ask that. I just thought I would. And in the spirit of playing it forward, I just thought what we, I, I wanted to know what you'd say. Thank you. So I'll, I'll yeah. look up Helen Chadwick. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to stop recording there and good night. <laughs>